Well, I got a call from my son from in Tulsa this week. He usually calls me to tell me a stupid dad joke, but <laughs> and he did. But he um, and ever since I, they were little and and I was little, I always told them about Jesus. But I didn't just tell them about Jesus. I told them the names of Jesus. You know, he's our Jehovah. He's a covenant God. He's a covenant keeping God. And I would tell them about Jehovah Shalom, our peace, and Jehovah. Shama, he's the Lord present. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. He's our Jehovah Sekinu, our righteousness. We can boldly come before his throne without guilt or condemnation to find grace to help in time of need. He's our Jehovah Makedesh. He's our sanctifier. He's our Jehovah Eri. He's the God who sees. He's the God. He's Jehovah. No, I already did that one. <laughs> he's our Jehovah Rapha, our healer. He's a Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And so I was kind of mentioning that to him. And he goes, mom, mom. Jesus is the name above all names. Well, first of all, he told me, that's Old Testament, Mom, and I was about to give it to him. You know, hey, no. He goes, no, Mom, Jesus is the name above all names. He's our new covenant. He's everything. He's all those. Amen. He's our peace. He's our deliverer. He's our healer. He's our sanctifier. Jesus, the name above all names. Amen. Jesus. We speak Jesus over this place today, the anointing. And the song before and just went right along with what God put on my heart, the great exchange. He's here to exchange some things from you today. All you have to do is just exchange. He wants to give, your gra give you gardens for your graves. He wants to give you oil of joy for your mourning. He wants to give you peace for your anxiety but he wants to exchange it. So that's what we're going to be ministering on today. Um, go ahead, Jeannie, and pull up. Thank you, Jesus. Psalms 24 in the NLT. And we're going to start in verse 7. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It says, open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the king enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the king of glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of heaven's army. He is the king of glory. So that's a song of David. He was saying that. But it just, it's kind of what, I was here Wednesday for prayer and I was looking at the lockers and, and God just dropped something in my heart and he said, I, I want to go in all of them. And I said, okay, that's what I'll minister on. So open up the gates. I actually want to read that scripture in the TPT, which is the passion, because I kind of like to understand. I just like plain. I like to be plain, practical. It says, so wake up. Wake up. That's what we need to do. We need to wake up, church. You living gateways, lift up your head. You doorways of eternity, welcome the king of glory. For he is about to come through you, you ask. Who is this king of glory? Yahweh, armed and ready for battle. Yahweh, invincible in every way. So wake up, you living gateways, and rejoice. Fling wide, you eternal doors. Here he comes, the king of glory, ready to come in, you ask. Who is this king of glory? He is Yahweh, armed and ready for battle. The mighty one, the invincible commander of heaven's host. Yes, he is the king of glory. He's the king of glory, and he wants to come in to your house. And I don't know about you, but that's a little scary. And I, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you guys see a little bit into my life, a little bit. So when we clean our house, the first thing my kids ask me is, who's coming? <laughs> because maybe we don't clean it unless someone's coming in. So, and I know... How many of you women here, if you hire a house cleaner, actually clean your house before she comes? Yeah, lots of people do that. I used to do that, and I thought, okay, no, I'm paying them. They're going to clean my house. But I still have rooms that I don't want them in because they're just too, too confused, too cluttered, too whatever, too 
just, I don't want him to see that I don't make my bed or whatever. I don't want him to see my office. I just come in, clean the bathrooms, do what people see. And so that's kind of how we are. The King of Glory is coming in. And so we come on Sundays and we've got our nice clothes on. Eugene's got his Christmas shirt on. And we, we took a shower probably. We cleaned up. And we said, okay, now I'm, I'm good enough. I can go to church now because we got our Sunday clothes on. So we cleaned up. So we can open one of these doors because this is the only one that we keep clean. It's not really clean. But so we open those doors because, but that's the only one. We relegate. This is God. You can have this one right here. This is the door. This is Sunday. This is who you have. This is, but he's saying, you know what? I want to come into all. And we're in a fast. And I don't know about you, but God's been dealing with me. And if you're not careful, guess what he's done? You, he's revealed maybe, just maybe, some idols in our life. Some, this is the best idol I could come up with. Some idols. And we may not have little statues in our house, but you know what an idol is? It's anything in your life that you go to before you go to God. Some of you have chose to fast some food. And you found out that when you're stressed, ah, that's not there. Some of you may go to sugar. Some of you may go, I mean, I don't know what you, some of you may go to your phone. You know, I really like to play games on my phone. Trivia crack. I'm really good at it. <laughs> But I found out that when I am stressed, that it's a stress reliever. I, that's an, it can be an idol. Now, don't excuse me. Don't get me wrong. These food's not bad. God made food for us to enjoy. Uh, those games are good for your mental health. Food's good for you. Sugar is okay in moderation. But when I've let it take the place of something that God wants to be in my life, I've made it an idol. There's all kinds of idols that we can make, even going to the gym. You know, if that's, and God made that so that we can relieve some energy. But if we put that in the place of God, then it's wrong. And God can tell, I'm not here up here to tell you that what you're doing is an idol in your life, but you know what? When you go on a fast, God usually reveals it to you. And I'm saying he's here today to exchange that. He's saying, I want to be king of your life. Yeah. There's lots of people that have said, okay, I believe Jesus, he walked on the earth 2,000 years ago, and he died for my sins. He's my savior. But that's as far as we've gotten. He's just our savior. We haven't made him Lord of our lives. There's a big difference between him saving us and being our Lord. Yes, he's our savior. We can't get to heaven without him. But is he your Lord? And I'm just going to read. I won't read it all. And it's, and it's not scripture and verse, but it's something I've been dwelling on all week. And it's a song, and it's a new song, and it's called Monday Morning Faith. And it says, I want to meet with you more than Sundays. I want to know more than just my mother's faith because that's not enough to get through the rough. Oh, I need a Monday morning faith. I want to hear you in more than just one way. Share your voice in the mundane things. You're, the in, you're in the in-between. You're in my everything, and that's all I really need. My soul sings in the morning. I love the king, and he loves me. And all that I'm compelled to bring is my everyday offering. Let my worship be more than just singing. When did music become a religious thing? Let those songs be what they're meant to be, the sound of your church awakening. Help my heart to keep up with the heavens where the angels sing 24-7. Praise, praise you more than enough to get me through the rough. And then it goes on. It says, hell's not scared of a Sunday faith. If it only leads to empty praise, what really makes the darkness run is when the saints arise and praise in quiet 
on Monday, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. That's when he wants us. He wants us all the days of the week. He wants to fling wide those gates and let the king of glory come in. He wants to exchange for you that great exchange, the anointing of the Messiah. He wants to refine us. You know, we, the church, if you've been in church at any time, love to talk about revival. Oh, we need revival. We need revival. I want revival. But do you know what revival really is? Uh, Charles Finney says, Revival is a renewed conviction of sin and repentance, followed by an intense desire to live in obedience to God. It is giving up one's will to God in deep humility. We do need revival, but that's what happens when the King of Glory comes in. We all think it's going to be harsh, but He is always gentle. He's always gentle. And when we let him come in and shine his light, we usually see things, whoa, maybe, that we didn't see before. And he's willing to exchange it for what he's got in plan for you. And his plan is always better. Amen? So when we want revival and when the light comes and shines on us, just like Isaiah, Isaiah in the Bible, when the king of glory came in, he said, oh, I am a man of unclean lips. I can't do this. All of a sudden, when we're faced with the perfect, we realize how imperfect we are. Oh my goodness, how can I do anything without him? I can't, I can't do anything. Take the coal, cleanse my lips, here I am. That's what Isaiah said. So, just real quick, I wanted to, and, and you know me, it's always going to be quick <laughs> on Sunday. I'm not going to make a record, Matthew. This won't be a record, hopefully, <laughs> of the shortest sermon ever. But um, So we've, we've got some doors that we're going to open. We talked about our secret idols, idols that maybe we've put in front of God. But there's some other things that are going to hinder us in revival. And that is meant, it's meant to keep us bound. All these changes, and, I'm, and it's actually pretty heavy, so. Can you imagine carrying this around everywhere you go? But you have an enemy that wants to do exactly that. He wants to put these chains on you and make you wear it everywhere you go. And that is a fence. And I know Pastor Margaret's been talking about a fence. You know, a fence is, uh, you know, if someone doesn't treat you right, guess what? Someone's always not going to treat you right. Someone's always going to mess. My mother loves me so much. And you know what? She does things that annoy me. Really? Eugene is the perfect husband. And he does things that annoy me. If I let it. I could always let that. So years ago, this is the best, and, and God spoke this to me a few weeks ago, that um, he reminded me, because we've been talking about wounds in our house. And it was years ago that I got a sticker in my finger. I thought I got it out. And I just, of course, I had five young kids at the time, and, and I don't know about you moms, but you just kind of don't think about very many other things than taking care of your kids. And so I just went on with my life, but then days went by, and I, my hand hurt so bad. My, every time I bumped my finger, it just hurt. You know, normally Eugene could come hold my hand, and it's no big deal. But he would come touch my hand. Ow, stop, don't touch me. Ah, hurt. You know, normal things coming across my finger would hurt. And that's what a wound is. We're walking around, and if we could see through God's eyes each other, we'd probably see lots of wounds that normally, in a normal person, you would think that shouldn't hurt at all. But there's a wound there that causes it to hurt. So it wasn't until it festered up, and I realized there was a sticker, and oh my goodness, did it hurt when it come out. But once it was out, 
all the pain was gone, and it allowed it to heal. And then I was studying in the office, and God said, you know, forgiving someone doesn't take away the hurt, but it does make it so that it won't get infected. The healing will come. The hurt may still be there. Someone really may have done you wrong. They may have hurt you. But if you choose to forgive them, basically you're taking the chains off of you. And I love the way Craig Groeschel puts it. It says, your life is too short and your calling too great to live offended. So once you choose, and that's a choice. You know, people... If you, if you have friends that are offended all the time, like no one can ever say anything right, and they're always taking something wrong and out of context, that number one, there's a wound there, but they're also in, in chains, in bondage. I'm saying, let's let it go. Choose to see people the way God sees them and let God come in and heal your wound, whether your wound is... I have no idea. I can't imagine. There's so many wounds today. You know, I, I know someone who's deathly scared to let their kids be out of their sight. Well, there's a wound there. You have no idea what happened to that little girl when she was a kid. And she doesn't want that to happen to her kids. There's a wound there. There's all kinds of wounds. And God's saying, I'm here. I can take care of it. I'm going to exchange. Um... So go ahead and bring up the anointing of the Messiah, which is Isaiah 61, 10. Let's read it in the NLT. Or actually, Jeannie, I, I like to read it in the King James, New King James. This is the spirit, of, and this is, Jesus actually read this in the New Testament too. He was reading it from Isaiah, but he's saying, hey, this is it, I'm here. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Number one exchange. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. If you have a broken heart here today, he's ready to exchange it and heal it. To proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion and to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Did you know that's the antidote to depression is worship? You cannot be depressed. And yes, you're saying, but depression is chemical. Worship releases the chemicals your body needs. I guarantee you. It is. They're all connected. You cannot separate your body from your spirit. You know, we are a spirit, soul, and body. And I used to like to put them in boxes because I like everything nice and organized. But you know what? It's more like Play-Doh. You can't separate them. They're all interconnected. And the only thing that separates them is the Word of God. So you want to get rid of depression? You have to praise the Lord through your mouth. And I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, it never fails. He releases those chemicals in your body when you praise the Lord. Something supernaturally happens, and those chemicals are released, and peace comes. Uh, they will be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Amen. So the great exchange, you know, we want to, that's what we're talking about. And the Lord just showed me, Open them up. You know, we have all... I didn't even test this out. There we go. Open them up. Open up. There's always one we want to keep because it's too scary. It's too dirty. No one will understand. God can have all this stuff, but he can't have that one. <laughs> So, but that's how we've lived our life. Are we going to live in just a Sunday morning faith? Or are we going to change it to Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday? Does that mean you have to be a preacher? No, that means you walk in your, your profession just like God's there. 
and you're worshiping him. You're, everything you do, you're doing it to worship the Lord. Whether you're a mom at home, picking up Cheerios off the floor, changing dirty diapers, you're doing it because that's what he called you to do. There is no, no greater work than to raise up the next generation to know him. Amen. There is no, no greater work. You know, for some reason, my parents probably instilled in me, there, I never once thought that there was nothing I couldn't do. I could do anything in the world. And so when I was at home raising five kids, I could have done anything. And I sometimes thought I could be doing anything else but this right now. But the, the Lord reminded, this is the greatest work. And people used to tell me, oh, it goes so quickly. And I'd go, no, it doesn't. (laughs) You're lying because this is no sleep and crying and throwing up. It lasts forever. But it does does go quickly. And you have time to do the other things that God put in your heart. You don't have to do them when your kids are little. That was for free. But moms, you're doing the greatest work. If you do nothing that day except sit in a chair and hold a little baby, you've done the best work. You have. And if you have friends that are out doing, I don't know, doctors and lawyers or whatever, and you think, I'm not doing anything. No, you are doing everything. Those kids need you. So if you're a cattleman, then you go out and you be the best cattleman there. If you're an accountant, a lawyer, whatever, he wants to invade your space. He wants to walk with you in your journey. If here, whatever you do, he wants you to do it with him. And that was another one that we kind of keep closed because we think, especially if you're strong, you think, well, I don't need Jesus. He gave me the strength to do it. Hey, that's an idol in our lives to think that I don't need him, I can do it myself. The most talented people are usually the hardest ones to surrender. And that's what we're talking about today, surrender. Surrender. Ask him to come and be a part of your life. If you're a good singer already, can you imagine what an amazing singer you would be if you ask him to come help you? I mean, don't be so prideful to think that you're the best already without the Lord to help you. You need him. He, we don't just need him. What you don't understand is he wants to be with you. It's a relationship. He wants to be part of your life. Can you imagine if I was married and never talked to Eugene except once a week? That wouldn't have the best relationship. Also, you know, it's, it is true. You don't have to come to church to be saved. Absolutely not. But if you really want a relationship, just like you don't have to be home to have a relationship with your husband or to be, you don't have to be home to be married, but your relationship will suffer if you're never home. And the same goes with church. This is where we get fueled up. This is where we get all the weight. Lord, I should have been talking to you all week, and now I'm reminded. I mean, those are the times we get built up, we learn, and we think, why did I even try this week without him? Because he was there waiting. He wants to be part of every part of our lives. I wouldn't have a friend with me go uh, to the store and never talk to him. You know, talk to him all the time. Talk to him all the time. He's there. He's listening. He's with you all the time. He wants to exchange that. He wants the great exchange. He wants to exchange your brokenness for joy. And this morning, I just, well, number one, I always want God to show up and just show up. But I feel like when we've been fasting, God's been talking to us. He's been revealing what we need because he needs us not only to be the light. He needs 
to shine the light on us to see what we need to change so that we can go out and be the light. Do you ever wonder why sometimes when you're the light, people get uncomfortable around you because they think you're, I don't know, they just are uncomfortable because the light in you is making them uncomfortable because you're revealing their sin, what's not even really needing to be. That's the anointing. That's the anointing. We need to be that way and not, not to be holier than thou, but to say, hey, I've been, your, I've been where you are and I've got someone you need to meet. He came and cleaned me up. See, we don't have to be like the moms that clean their house before the cleaner comes. That you can't do that. You can't clean up your life and then say, well, I'm going to get this all cleaned up get myself all and then I'll go to church or I'm gonna stop doing this or stop smoking or stop drinking or stop doing whatever and then I'll come to the Lord no he says bring it bring it that's he says come as you are he really does love you just the way you are but guess what he ate with sinners and prostitutes and some people in the hyper grace movement, you know, loves you just the way you are. He absolutely does. He wants to be part of every part of your life. He loves the prostitute. He loves the sinner. But you know what? They never left his presence the same. They never left his presence the same. They didn't go and continue being prostitutes and sinners. But from that point on, they were changed. And that's what he's called the church to do. It's time for the church to rise up and say, okay, Lord, does this, show me, just bring it. What do I need to change? Show me those wounds in my life that I've kept for so long that I need surgery on. We really do need divine surgery. He's the only one to get those stickers out that have caused you to be offended over every little thing. Let's just deal the, with the root. I mean, I, can't, I can get up here, Pastor Morgan can get up here and say, you know, you're putting a bucket over your light when you're offended. And she can say that all you want and, and say, hey, you're offended. She can point you out and say, you're being offended. And you go, I know, but I don't know what to do about it. Well, you're gonna have to have some divine surgery. You know, the anointing of the Messiah is here to deliver you from that today. He wants you to lay down your hurts. He wants you to lay down your broken heart. He wants your addictions. You know, the late uh, Jack Hayford said this, you can't, you can't cast out the flesh and you can't discipline a demon. Okay, I know that's a little, little touchy for the American church, but if Jesus cast out demons when he was walking on the earth, we probably should be doing that now because we sure don't want to leave them in. And we still live in the same world. But you can't discipline a demon, but you can't cast out the flesh, and that's what the fast basically reveals. Is it your flesh or is it a something you need to deal with. Let me tell you, porn addictions, addictions have demonic spirits behind them and you need to cast them out. He wants to exchange that with you this morning. Your porn addiction that is secret in those doors that you won't let anybody see, he's here to deliver you from them. He wants you free. He wants you free because he loves you you. He wants you free. He wants you walking in freedom. He doesn't want that for your life. He wants you free. He wants to exchange something. So go ahead and stand up. I'm just going to, there's no need of talking when he wants to just, we might as well just get it done. Amen. So here in a minute, we're going to exchange some things this morning. I believe that you shouldn't come to church just to come to church. I think something ought to happen. I think you, we ought to just get everything out of the way so we can go be the light. That's what we need to be. We can't be playing around anymore. The time is too close. 
The time is too close for us to be playing church. We can't play church anymore. It's time for us to walk out, get our glory back on, get the dust off, get the stuff that's been holding us back off and say no more. You're not going to hold me back anymore. I'm not going to be addicted anymore. This porn addiction will not destroy my life, will not destroy my marriage. This chemical addiction, if you're addicted to chemicals, can be gone. Depression can be an addiction. And you know what? I know the healer, and he's a big God. And you know what? It is nothing for him to come and touch your brain and that uh, and soothe it and the chemicals be released. So I just believe God that he's going to do what he says he's going to do, whether we feel it or not. But I want you to close your eyes and I want God, you to ask God what you've been keeping that he wants to deliver you from this morning. This morning, he wants to deliver you. He wants you to walk out of this place free. He wants you to walk out of this place to be the light that he's called you to be to the world that needs you. He, they need you. I can't go where you go. You go to the places I people I can't see. He's called you. He's called you to be that. So as he's telling you what you need to let go, I'm going to pray, and it's going to leave. So you just lift it up to him and believe and agree with this prayer. Father God, your presence is here, and I know you want your people free. So Father, as they lift up this thing that's bound them for so many years, Father God, exchange, exchange it for your peace, your healing, your deliverance. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I speak freedom to this entire place. Bonds you break in Jesus' name. Father, anoint these people. Burn their light within them so they can walk out of this place free and a new creature. Draw them to you. Draw them to you. In Jesus' name. I believe it. Now, if you want extra prayer, not extra prayer, come to the front. We're willing to pray for you. But I believe January 15th, you mark it on your calendar. You write down, I am free. Amen? So you walk out of this place free. There's no reason to not. And so, unless you need prayer, I guess I just dismiss you. Mom, do you have something? Never mind. Wait. I really appreciate the message that came forth this morning. Uh, I think it was very, very timely. I know he's been speaking that in my heart as well. But a scripture came to my mind, and uh, if you are still back there, Jeannie, could you find Isaiah, the 60th chapter? Because I believe that this year, you know, I've been seeking the Lord during this fasting time, and my whole prayer is, Lord, what do you have for me what do you have for our church during this coming year? And I, I really feel like that this is the time that we're, we're entering into a major change in the body of Christ. And I believe that it's, it's talked about in Isaiah, the 60th chapter. Start, uh, do this in the Amplified, if you would, please. Uh, for the first verse. Just start at the beginning. Because Kim was talking about the glory of the Lord entering in. We use that kind of lightly. But the glory of the Lord is the presence of the Lord. Yeah. 
And I feel like Moses many times, whenever he said to the Lord, if you don't go with me, I'm not going. Yeah. And I don't know where for sure that we're going to go. He just says go. But if you don't go with us, Lord, we're not going. And so what Kim's been talking about this morning arise from the depression and prostration, prostration in which circumstances has kept you. Rise to a new life. Shine. Be radiant with the glory of the Lord. For Victory Center, your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Amen. And then it goes on to talk about the gross darkness in the world. Yeah, we know that. There's gross. I mean, it is gross. The darkness is gross. But, he goes on to say, but, but my light will shine upon you. Now, that's good news. We don't have to be a part of the grossness. Amen. We're going to be different. This is going to be a different year. And we're going to see the manifestation of the glory of God in our individual lives, in our church, and I'm believing in our city. And I'm believing in our country. Amen. We need it desperately. So I just wanted to exhort you, she's, uh, that message is very, very timely. And I believe that as she prayed that... There were some things that was released from the lives of, of you people that maybe have been struggling for a long time. It's gone. Amen. You're changed. And tomorrow is what day? Monday. Yeah. Monday Guess what? Morning faith. You're going to have Monday morning faith. Amen. And you're going to experience the presence of the Lord. Amen. And you're dismissed.